I think this is a fascinating topic, one that I'm very excited about. I'll try to let you, try to let some of that enthusiasm rub off a little bit. And if you're here, that shows your enthusiasm as well. So I also love to uh, answer questions and or hear what your particular thoughts are about climate change, environmental variation, phenology, which I'll define in a few minutes, flowering, plant and animal interactions, biological invasions, anything. I'm an ecologist. I like to think about how organisms interact with their environment and how the environment is driving changes in the natural world that we all depend on. So I'm very, very pleased to, to be here to talk to you about a new program, a new national biological monitoring program. And Dan, I don't remember exactly what you called it. Didn't integrated observing platform with infrastructure for ecological and biological assessments on a national scale. That sounds pretty, pretty scary. Um, and uh, it, it, it simply is, but, but that's right, that's an excellent, that's an excellent definition uh, of what it is that we're trying to do. Uh, but in order to create something like that, a national observing platform, a national observing system, you need more than all of the PhD ecologists and scientists and biologists and park service and who are out there. You need to include many more people than that to create a continental instrument with 10,000 observation locations or more we'd like to have across the nation where we're tracking the timing of nature's pulse, if you will, the timing of leafing and flowering when birds arrive, when animals migrate or hibernate, or when they're reproducing or when they're producing eggs or when they're fledging or when the bees are arriving bringing honey into a hive. Because we depend on all of those things and we spend millions of dollars trying to manage ecological systems in a changing environment. So our environment is changing a lot every day and we're taking the pulse of the planet by, by watching and observing what happens to nature. So I'm not a climate scientist. I won't be talking about climate change and, and global circulation models and global warming that much because first I'd like to focus on the biological response of systems to environmental variation and change. And second of all, we don't, when we're studying phenology, we're studying things like flowering or leafing or wheat heading dates or the expansion of a virus through mosquito vectors across the nation. You don't need to necessarily think about it in terms of a climate change context. So independent of what, you know, there's a lot of pol political talk right now about what is the role, what is climate change, you know, is it really happening, what's the role of human beings. Uh, the science, science is there, the science says the climate is changing. Human beings and carbon dioxide concentrations and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are contributing to those changes. But independent of that, we can track what's going on across the nation and, and use that in our everyday life independent of any sort of climatic change or directional climatic change or anthropogenic climate change, sometimes what it's called. As a quick introduction, just what am I going to be talking about? And these are, the, these are the only screens we've got. So if you're having a little trouble seeing, they're a bit fuzzy, I encourage you just to come on right up, right up front. and. Uh, and get, get right up closer so you can see I've got a lot of pretty slides. I don't have a lot of words. There's a few cases where it's a little bit, a little bit wordy, and uh, so be, feel free to come on up. I won't bite. So I want to start out with sort of a bit of a definition of phenology. And of course, my title talks about Nature's Notebook, and that's what I'm going to be featuring. But I think in order to kind of get there into this, up, this participatory monitoring program that I'll be talking about, I need to do a little scaffolding with you. Just make sure that everyone's on the same page in terms of phenology and not phrenology. Not the study of the bumps on the head as a as a way to assess moral character. A little bump right there. What that means? Uh, too much too much education probably. I would guess. Um, why is phenology important? What is it? You know, what is this? Who cares if things are changing? What if the flowers come out on the cherry blossoms earlier this year? Does that that doesn't really have much impact? Of course, if you're a storekeeper, you know, uh, in the area, that's really important to you. Um, what is the phenology network itself? How are we trying to organize information? And then kind of to the to the meat of what is promised in that title slide about nature's notebook, so that you can be an informed observer as part of a national system of observers who are out tracking biological response of organisms across the landscape and how you can actually get involved. So I'm going to have a variety of different kinds of topics here. I've got a, probably a pretty broad audience. Some of it will be a little bit, there'll be a little science, there'll be a little bit of management, um, there'll be a little bit of education, there'll be a little bit of how you might get involved if you have your own organization and are looking to expand that into activities like monitoring plants and animals and engaging the public and doing a little climate literacy and a little science literacy as you go along. So what is phenology? I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Ken, it's not that phrenology. 
or it's not phenomenology, but it does come from the same Greek root, to show or to appear, so the study of when things come or show up or appear, the study of the timing of life cycle events of plants and animals. Um, and, or some folks call it, in fact, there's a British phenology network, they call it nature's calendar. There's a Dutch phenology network, they call it nature's, ca nature's calendar. I can't do the Dutch accent. Um, there are, there, Australia has a climate watch, etc. So we considered using the term nature's calendar for our program called Nature's Notebook, um, but it was taken. So we came up with Nature's Notebook because we want to include everybody in that particular project, and I'll tell you more about that. So more than just when things happen, we want to know why things are happening. I'm going to call just, I'm a scientist, I'm, a, I'm studying mechanisms. What is the reason why we have plants and animals coming out earlier in the spring? What are the downstream consequences? What, what happens? What does that really mean? So not only what is the study of the timing of life cycle events, but the causes and the consequences of those changes on a landscape scale. So just to make sure we're all kind of talking the same thing, so here's a few nice examples um, of phenological change where we see timing of migrations, say, or when wildflowers come out in the spring or in the autumn when leaves co change color. And all these have really important implications. You know, if you're, if you're uh, a lion and you're, uh, you're after some gazelle, or if you're a hummingbird or a bee and you need wildflowers and nectar or other resources, or if you're an animal that's depending upon masting of oaks, which is the production of the acorns in the fall, like black bears are, um, or if you're a bird, you need to, you're aware of habitat, or if you're a global change scientist, you need to know what's the, what are the dynamics and patterns of carbon across the landscape. When leaves fall, that means they're no longer photosynthesizing. They're going to be, they're going to be eaten up by microbes. We call heterotrophic respiration. That carbon dioxide will go back in the atmosphere, and you can measure it in the atmosphere. So there's a lot of cycling of carbon from natural systems into the atmosphere that is controlled by primary production, which is leaves producing sugars from carbon dioxide and storing them and then releasing them. So again, why do we, why do we want to focus on something like phenology? Hopefully it's starting to kind of get clear that, boy, just about anybody can do phenology. You know, even this guy with all that education um, can go out and do phenology. But seriously, everybody can. It's easy to observe. And there's scientific, under, there's scientific basis to every observation. Does this plant have flowers on it or not? Yes. It's easy to observe. Did you see a hummingbird? Yes. Um, did you see a bee? Yes. It's critical for plants and animals. Of course, species interactions are critical to when, th when things happen, it's critical to species interactions. It's like how we interact with our garden almost. You know, you don't want to go out too early in the year. You've got a frost. You want to wait until, boy, it seems like a nice warm day. Ooh, there's a big cold front that zapped me yesterday morning at 8.45, and at 8.30 it was 80 degrees and all I had on was just my sweater. Um, and so uh, it's also critical for people, as I just pointed out, and um, it's also very sensitive to environmental variation. So the cherry blossoms, for example, there are still blossoms on the trees out there. It went down the tidal basin yesterday, but not on the east side, over by the, over by the monument. Over on the west side, they're still there because they're protected from the prevailing winds, or at least when the winds came through. And so there's cherry blossoms that are fully on those particular plants. So there's actually a lot of spatial variation caused by things just like local weather conditions. And through time, what drives the flowers to come up in your yard? The tulips or the daffodils seem like the daffodils are coming out earlier this year. Ha, they are. If you're in the park service and you're managing invasive species, and it seems like the invasive species came up earlier this year and set seed, ha, they are. And then unfortunately, they did it before you got the college students there who were doing all the invasive plant control up in Acadia National Park, and they arrived there last year, and there was nothing for those, those summer students to do because the, all the weeds had already set their seeds, and if they went out and worked with them, they're going to spread seeds all over the place, and that was going to be it. And so it's going to take the Park Service three years to change their hiring practices to bring in people, because it's the federal government, it's going to take three years to change the hiring practices because they can't just put, you know, uh, full-time permanent people on the weed pulling duty. It's going to take a while to bring in the next cadre of folks because spring came early. Invasives did their stuff early up there. The colleges got out at the same time as they did last year, which makes sense. So that's a, that's a mismatch, a decoupling that's having major impacts on the number of weeds you'll see this year in Acadia National Park. But don't tell them I told you that story because it'll be embarrassing to them. But they fully know of it, they fully are aware of it, and they're thinking about, I'm a resource manager, and I've got to manage human populations, and I've got to manage natural populations, and I've got to put the two together. 
Timing is everything, we say. So phenology, as I've kind of pointed out, is affecting the abundance and, di and diversity of organisms across the landscape. How are they interacting with one another? How are they interacting? Uh, what are their seasonal behaviors, patterns? If you have mast years in oaks, a lot of mast is produced each every, every other year. You can, actually see, you can actually see patterns that affect bird migrations and abundances on a biennial, uh, biennial pattern across North America. Um, you can see bears going hungry uh, in years when you don't have mass being produced. And as I've talked about already, carbon dioxide concentrations and water vapor, when a leaf comes on, on, say, one of those little cherry trees, Prunus yetoensis, down there around the tidal basin, it starts sucking up carbon dioxide through those little stomates and letting out water. And when you take all the leaves in North America and you have them all operating simultaneously, that's a lot of exchange of carbon in and water out. And when they drop off, in the fall, that's a huge impact, and we can measure it using instrumentation on the top of a mountain in Hawaii, on Mauna Loa, the Mauna Loa Observatory. Carbon dioxide concentrations in the air are increasing. We know we have really good technology. We know exactly what the CO2 concentration in the air is down there, and you can see it go like this over time. That little pulse that you see here is the breathing of the biosphere. It's the activity of vegetation in the northern, hem northern hemisphere. We can talk more about that later on. So far, I haven't really talked about climate change or environmental variation very much at all, but the folks who wrote, the Nobel Prize winners who wrote the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that big, that big 2,000 author uh, document that you've been, you've been hearing about and reading about, a bunch of scientists getting together and were hammering out their differences. So phenology, they wrote, is perhaps the simplest process in which you can track the changes of eco in the ecology, what things are doing and where they are a species in response to climate change. So the IPCC had this document, it's a big bunch of documents, and one of the chapters focused on what have we seen? What is the fingerprint of climate change impacts on the natural ecological systems that we've seen so far? A whole chapter devoted to that. A big part of it was for, on phenology, because that's an early warning sign, an early indicator of change. If it gets hot in here, we're all going to change our behavior. The next thing we might do is change our phenology, the timing of when we do things. Okay, there's a little difference there between behavior and phenology, but it's not, we're not going to die out. Extinctions happen much later on, but it's the phenology that happens early on as an early, early indicator, and they had about 40,000 different data sets, 39,998 of them were from Europe. So we're just getting going on building a USA national phenology network. I'll talk more about that here in a few minutes. And people love it. John Metcalf from ABC7 called me up and he said, can you tell me whether spring is arriving earlier in Washington, D.C.? And he called Sylvia Orley down at the U.S. Herbarium and he called uh, Greg Butcher, who's with Audubon, and said, tell me, is it coming earlier? This was just a couple weeks ago. And EPA had this big meeting and I was standing out there in Clarendon answering, trying to answer this guy's questions because I couldn't get reception in the naval, naval building there. And... Um, he wanted to know, how many days earlier is it coming? Is it coming earlier? How many days earlier? And so I'm scientizing. Well, it don't depends. Uh, that's not what they're looking for. But then we were featured later on that evening on the news. You know, it's like, wow, this little thing. Hey, there's a new blog. You know, is climate changing? Is weather changing? Is spring coming earlier? So it really resonates a lot with people. And it is changing. Spring is coming earlier. And there's a whole host of different ways you can figure that out. You can track that kind of change through time. Here's one way, for example. Seems like spring's coming up earlier. My daffodils are coming up earlier. I'll just write that down in my little notebook here. Uh, here they took pictures. This is Lowell Cemetery in Massachusetts. 30th of May in 1868 on the left. 30th of May in 2005 on the right. Okay, this doesn't mean that global warming is happening or like that. It doesn't even necessarily mean that it necessarily is, spring necessarily is coming earlier. It's just two points in time. But when you take the aggregate of all the photos through time, you can find these amazing trends. And it is coming earlier. And here on the eastern seaboard, it's about three weeks earlier, but it depends on how you slice it. If you're looking at using satellites to measure the entire forest green slime, they call it down there, or if you're looking at a little flower, the first flower on the cherry blossoms, plants are really variable, or the first robin, I'm a plant ecologist, so I'll, I'll try to talk to you animal people. Uh, but we do have a multi taxa monitoring program because it's really important to think about plants and animals and how they interact. And then there's scientists who come in. They say, well, let's take a look and see what is happening, kind of a more scientific basis. This is Camille Parmesan. She's at UT Austin. And she said, let's get together with economists Gary Yohe and do what they call a meta-analysis, take all the published literature, 
where people have actually gone through the publication process where they were actually looking at phenology records. They found 677 species total. They had a variety of different data sets um, ranging from 16 years through time. What is a trend? How many years? My taxi cab driver asked me the other day. How many taxi cab drivers are really great? They're, they're totally tuned into the environment. They, they know a lot uh, about what's going on around them and how that affects the ebb and pulse of folks who need a cab or, or et cetera. He's like, oh, you probably won't want to go to the Cherry Blossom, Cherry Tidal Basin today, will you? I was like, nah. 232 years and an average of about 45 years, and they found that of those organisms that they'd looked at, the people had published back in 2003 in a paper in Nature, two-thirds of them basically had changed to earlier in the spring. And recently there was a paper that came out in another, uh, another uh, scientific article that came out where someone done the same thing relatively recently and found that the, the number was closer to 82%. So when it depends on, it, it, so it depends a little bit on kind of how we're accumulating information that, that's showing that there is indeed a change. But here's where the science comes in, and this I think is pretty much my only graph in here. In here, so the bottom line here is that the bars represent the responses for different kinds of organisms, and the responses differ. The size of the bar changes, and so technically what this is is a little graph showing the variation. Uh, between the different kinds of organisms from Camille's paper that she did. She went back in a paper in Global Change Biology a couple years later and said, well, let's break this down and see if we find trends from different kinds of organisms. Amphibians, birds, butterflies, herbs and grasses, shrubs, trees, fish, mammal. And this scale here shows the change in spring timing in days per decade. So one way to kind of put it all onto the same scale from zero to ten. So on average, about, about three days earlier phenology based on all the work that she'd done. Not much, about three days. But you can see here that different organism types had very different sensitivities. Amphibians, very sensitive. The same for the, the very few data sets for mammals that they had. Um, so if you have birds or butterflies that are dependent upon herbs or grasses or flowering shrubs, you can see that through time, this is days per decade, on the average about four days per decade. If something's changing and other things aren't, you can end up with a mismatch or a decoupling. And so we see that. We've seen it with bay checker spot butterfly on the San Francisco uh, Peninsula. And this is a, fan, uh, a very, very well-known, well-documented study in, uh, uh, from Europe, Visser and Both et al., this paper published in Nature. A lot of work has been done on this system. And this is a, a, a three-way interaction. We call it tritrophic interaction between oak leaves that come out early in the spring, a winter moth, a larva of a moth, a caterpillar comes along and munches on those leaves before they build up too much defenses. And a flycatcher that arrives from, North Af from northern Africa, it's a migratory bird, the pied flycatcher, that, that subsists pretty much solely on these moths. It doesn't eat other kinds of mo moth larvae, just these. And so you have this tritrophic relationship where different organisms are eating each other in succession, and things are changing. It's not stable at all. The oak... There's been substantial warming in the British Isles, and the oaks are coming out about two weeks earlier. Well, as it turns out, that's not a problem for the, for the larvae, the, the caterpillars. They come out a couple weeks earlier, too, probably being driven by the same thing, warming temperatures in the soil to tell the oak leaves to come out, and the caterpillars, it's time to get, to get munching. But remember, our migrant, a long-distance migrant, actually a relatively short-distance migrant from Africa, conditions aren't quite the same in North Africa as they are in the southern British Isles. And so it's getting different cues, and it's arriving in the British Isles at the same time each year. And because it doesn't have resource substitutability, it can't eat other things, these moths, as it turns out, are already gone. The larvae are already gone, and so we've seen these populations decline because of starvation on the order of 90 to 95%. And, so what's, and there's a number of other kinds of examples like that where we have organisms arriving. We're expecting them to do some ecosystem services for us, but the ecosystem has changed and it's an unstable system as a result. So there's a lot of science behind that, kind of glossing a little bit, but that's the bottom line is you have these mismatches, and the more we look for them, the more we find them. And how do we use this information then? A whole host of different ways. I've already hinted at a bunch of them. Pollen bomb here a few years ago. Boy, if only we had known that that was going to happen. Well, we, you know, we could have figured that out. Pollen, the production of pollen, that's a phenological event. Mosquitoes, we're concerned about mosquitoes spreading up and spreading diseases and other vectors for Lyme disease or dengue fever or whatever. And that's a phenological event when the mosquitoes come out and spreading disease or other disease interactions. How water moves through systems. Farmers do phenology all the time, constantly managing the cultivars and the time they plant and the time they harvest. They're, modif they're modifying that. Fires, when the flowers on the lilacs come out early, before May 20th in the western United States, it's more likely to be a big fire year out there. 
What makes flowers come out early on lilacs? Warmer, drier springs. The soil is warmer and drier. The woods are warmer and drier. A greater chance of bigger fires. Just using simple correlations between the records of number of large fires and the timing of flowers that come out on the lilacs. Hunting seasons, when people go see pretty fall colors, when we mow, how we manage birds around the airports, because we're ending up with birds that are no longer migrating. And so if you're managing bird populations and trying to keep them out of bird engines, you've got a problem here in the context of environmental variation and change, and you need phenological information fast, and you need it bad. How do we take advantage of all that? Okay, nice setup there, well seen. Now what? Okay, that's where the phenology network comes in. The U.S. National Phenology Network is a partnership-driven organization. I'll talk more about that in a, in a second. And it was set up when, when in 2000, when at some workshops in 2005, a bunch of scientists got together. They were trying to build this new continental instrument, another instrument called NEON, the National Ecological Observatory Network. Half billion dollars, 60 locations across the United States. They were going to monitor the heck out of everything to answer key questions about climate change impacts, biological invasions, etc. A really big project funded by the National Science Foundation. And there are folks there who said, okay, you're going to monitor 60 locations across the United States. And Neon is a good colleague and collaborator, but I will set them up a little bit. At 60 locations across the United States, is that going to be enough locations? How about like phenology? Because it's easy to observe, it's tied to environmental variation, you guys are already on board with that. And, and you can have people do it anywhere across the entire US and have many observations. And just focus on one thing, the phenology, the timing of when things happen as an early indicator of environmental change. Hence the National Phenology Network. The USA National Phenology Network, like I mentioned, there's already a bunch of other national phenology networks out there. And I'm a plant ecologist, but I'm, I've, uh, so I find myself surprised and thinking data. Data and information, that's actually really what we need. There's lots of good information out there. Thoreau's data sets, Lewis and Clark's data sets for phenology. Aldo Leopold collected phenology information. Um, Teddy Roosevelt was reporting to a North American bird phenology program that we're helping run on cards. I saw such and such birds arriving in North America here. And there's a lot of phenology information out there. And we're trying to take that and collect and organize that historical information and bring in contemporary information and match them together to create a national network of integrated, temporally and spatially integrated for plants and animals, observations across space and time. That means across the US through time. That's what the phenology network is all about. Base stable support comes from the US Geological Survey, but it was envisioned when it was set up as a partner-driven Project. That's why we're a .org, USANPN.org. Does USGS run a .org? Eh, I'm a USGS scientist. I'm a college scientist. Probably shut up here. But the, the idea is that it's a partnership. And so NASA and NOAA and Park Service and Fish and Wildlife Service and a lot of the other organizations in this building, including BLM. And yesterday I was over with talking to the Forest Service. And in the afternoon I was talking to the folks over at the Smithsonian. They're all interested in being a part of this network, and they can because it's built that way. It's designed to bring together scientists, government agencies of all colors and, and sorts, nonprofit groups, tribes, educators, learners of all ages, and y'all, if you're interested, to track the impacts of environmental variation and climate change on plants and animals across the US through this thing called Nature's Notebook I'll talk about it in just a minute. So our key goal, simply, understand how plants, animals, and landscapes respond to environmental variation and climate change. What are the marmots doing? We know that the timing of when marmots comes out actually affects their size at hibernation, their abundance, the number of males in the population has a lot of impacts that we never would have expected. Pollen production, tourism. Our missions are to make phenology information, data, models, and related information available to scientists, to resource managers, policymakers, and the public. If we're trying to determine what's the relationship between phenology and fires, What's the relationship between phenology of junipers and pollen going up your nose? What's the start of the season across North America? How does that relate to carbon dioxide sequestration? Remember why Kyoto failed? Why we didn't, well, we didn't go sign on Kyoto? Because we were pretty sure that North America is a really good sink already for carbon. So we really need to back that kind of information up with good models that show how much carbon is being produced. And when the leaves come on, they start sucking up that carbon. Our second mission, encouraging people of all ages and backgrounds to observe and record phenology. Remember, it's relatively straightforward. 
And so we've got people who have been part of the historic Lilac phonology monitoring network. We've got uh, some second graders who are contributing through uh, a collaborating project. We've got folks down at Jean Lafitte, uh, National uh, Historic Park and Preserve, who are collecting phonology information. And she's actually really interested in plant, wildlife, human interactions in Tanzania and, um, and is here learning about how vegetation activity interacts with animal activity and human activity. So what is the network again? All these folks, okay? Everybody who is contributing information or using information that we generate collectively is part of the network. So I'm at the National Coordinating Office trying to coordinate this. These are not cats. These are herds of cats, or I don't know what to call it. Sometimes, you know, talking to the Forest Service and going up and talking to Dan Ash, Fish and Wildlife Service, and Marsha McNutt, we told her about it. The other day, I gave her a briefing, her first briefing, and she was really excited. She said, wow, this is a really great program because of the citizen science component. And I was like, oh, citizen, you know, the part where we get the public engaged. And I said, that's, that's nice. Uh, I'm surprised. That's great. I was coming at it from more of a science perspective. She said, yeah, I want to get the public involved because the public, they're collecting information and adding information to sort of our collective knowledge. They start to trust the information because it's their information. I said, well, the question I always get is about quality control. You know, in public, are they, uh, what about quality data? She said, well, they're, they're out there with their cell phones. They're taking pictures, and they got date, time, and geolocation stamps on them, right? I was like, we're working on that app right now, ma'am. So, yes, we can include the public in this network, and they can be a part of it. With a little bit of training, anybody can tell you that they've seen spawning salmon in the stream, white-tailed deer, etc. And there's a lot of diversity out there, isn't there? How do you develop a monitoring program to kind of capture all this for native plants and animals on a, on a national scale? Well, we've been working on that. It's been working on it for the last three years into the form of what we call Nature's Notebook, keeping tabs on what's going on with plants and animals, a, a phenology observation program. Nature's Notebook is, is one project. There are other phenology observation programs around the U.S. Probably some of you are part of that. Anybody here involved with Monarch Watch, Great Sunflower Project, eBird, Nest Watch, Ice Watch USA, Frog Watch USA, the list goes on and on of those kinds of organizations. And after this evening, I'll fly up to New York, and there's a meeting, a conference over the next couple of days of people who help run those programs. They're called PPSRs, Public Participation in Science and Research. A whole new field has emerged just in the last couple of years, in big part because of technology and managing information. And I'm really interested in the data part. I'm interested in the science part, but I'm also interested in the data part. It's like, wow. How is Frog Watch USA collecting and storing and managing and versioning and making available and describing and sharing and integrating their information, for example? Neon, they won't have any problems. They got a half billion dollars. Frog Watch got about 45 bucks. We've got about 90 bucks. How do we do that in this information age? Linking science and information people together. Relatively straightforward process. Figure out what you want to look at, learn how to observe, go get registered and start reporting. So, into what was promised in the title, Nature's Notebook, we're trying to engage citizens and scientists to collect information on. We have around 260 plant species. We started out very small, built the number up by vetting it with scientists and resource managers and the park service and said, we need species along these lines. And folks uh, and the neon people said, we need, we need to do some phenology monitoring too. Can, we, can you make sure that you have species on there that will be appropriate for all of our 60 locations? I'm like, sure, no problem whatsoever, and animal species as well in an integrated framework. And, I, um, and we have people all across the nation. And so this figure is a little bit old. We have around 3,000 registered observers. And we have some better, newer maps now. But I thought it was just really, I was tickled to see the observers. This might be out in Edmonton and folks up in Alaska. And I think at the time we didn't have anybody yet in Hawaii. The program's been around since 2009, basically. We opened the doors of the coordinating office of the network in 2007. We worked very, very hard, very, very fast, built it on some existing work that had already been done to get things up and rolling. In 2009, we had data for plants. In 2010, we have data for animals as well. So you can go online, download the data. If you're a scientist in here, I don't know who my audience is, you can download the data. You can get the metadata. It's FGDC-compliant metadata. We have a data use policy. It's about 10 pages long. And you can get the information on plant and animal activity on a national scale to the nearest six decimal points on lat long. So how do you do that? Right now you go to the USA NPN webpage. We haven't split out Nature's Notebook into its own separate webpage quite yet. 
because we're scientists. And someone said, you need to split out nature's notebook from the rest of the, to the, from the network, which is also doing things like coordinating remote sensing activities, bringing people together, talking about carbon, et cetera. So you go to nature's notebook, and we'll work on splitting that out as soon as we can see if we can find or buy the URL. I'm doing things I never imagined that I would ever do as a scientist. Go on godaddy.com and buy a URL. So the first step, choose your site. This is my site. Choose it carefully so it's pretty. And you'd like to go back to it. I started in February of last year. I told my wife I'm going to go do Nature's Notebook out of Pima Canyon outside of Tucson, just north of, just north of town. It's about 15 minutes drive or so from my house up to the wilderness area. It's administered by the U.S. Forest Service. It's a wilderness area in the Catalina Mountains. Choose a pretty site. I go out every week. I didn't think I would. I was like, oh, I'm an executive director. Executive directors don't have to do this. Stuff. I love it. It's a good chance to get out of the house. I go up and do my phenology monitoring in a riparian corridor. You're like, wait, so where I was going to go in a riparian corridor? You're right there in the upland right next to it. It snowed a couple weeks ago. It was great. I went up and sat on a rock and did my phenology monitoring. I'm tracking the phenology of flowering saguaros, the invasive buffalo grass, and I'll tell you a few more stories about that over the next couple of slides, and some of the Fremont cottonwoods in the bottom of the valley, and a few scattered ocotillos and a couple of other things, and I love it. It's easy, and it's fun, and I get to enter my data, and I get to see my data right away. I'll show you that. So we've got a site. Choose a pretty site. We've got to choose some organisms there. Choose from the list of species. And this one here is a little innocuous-looking grass, but I put a little icon there to remind, be sure to remind you and me to address the issue that even though it's innocuous-looking, it's a real problem. You don't have a lot of grasses in the desert. That's not where the grasses grow. The grasses grow in grasslands, and the deserts don't have grasses, and they're not adapted to fire at all. They're very prone to fire, and so if we can keep track of when this stuff is green, we can do planning and manage when we go out with the crews to spray the herbicide on the stuff or pull it up. I'll talk more about that in a second. So I'm monitoring three buffalo grass. So you can choose from the list of species. If you see something you really want to monitor, I'm, a head of a, I'm, I'm the head of a research learning center here in Rock Creek Park, uh, and I want to do phenology monitoring, and you don't have... Liriodendron tulipifera, tulip poplar on your list. Actually, we do. I'm just trying to think of something we don't have on the list. We have more and more species every day. Let us know, and we'll do what we can to get it. the protocols developed and vetted by scientists and back up on the list. Choose your organism carefully. Multiple individuals. We prefer natural areas. Native species mostly, although we have invasive species. We have ornamentals. We have agricultural species as well. Got your plants or your animals? Go out and make your observations. So these are some folks who came to the George Wright Society down in New Orleans a few weeks ago. We went out to Jean Lafitte Natural Historic Preserve, the Barataria Preserve. We walked down the trail. We monitored red maple, uh, a suite of, uh, of birds, um, a few mammals, uh, snakes, reptiles, and insects uh, as, we walked as we walked along the trail. Relatively straightforward, recording our information as we go. So we've got little nice data sheets. We don't have an app for that. Quite yet, we will. Um, so you record information on paper, and uh, we're working with the Park Service on a number of different projects, so that's what it looks like for, say, a grass phenophase data sheet. It looks complicated, but that's because you might want to go out multiple times. Don't have to, and don't have to fill out that whole data sheet if you don't want to. Each time you say, Was this, did you see green leaves on your buffalo grass? Yes, no, or I didn't look. Did you see seeds? Did you see emerging leaves? Did you see flowers? And yes, no, I answer. And then you can take your data and you can look at it. You can download your data if you want to. It comes as a flat CSV file. Or you can go into our visualization tool and you can find your site. So this is Tucson. My house is about here. It takes me a few minutes to get up to the natural area, go through a conservation easement to the federal land. Up, this is wilderness area, US, uh, US Forest Service Minister wilderness area. That's my site. I call it Lower Pima Canyon site and I'm monitoring three buffalo grass there. And so I'm going to take a look. These are my data, actually, from this visualization tool. And I'm just showing you one of my buffalo grasses because there's a lot of information here. I'm going to collect a lot of information. It's easy. It's yes, no, or I didn't look. The buffalo grass lowest on the rocks, which is what I'm calling that particular individual. And this is for the year 2010 from January through November. I started monitoring in about February. So I, I wasn't necessarily looking for our first flower or anything like that. We've modified the system, so we do what we call status monitoring, where you go out and you say, yes, no, I didn't look. That way people can go out any time of the year. 
and they can record information, and they rec can record what we call negative data. I, I looked, but I did not see. That's called negative data. And that's really important because it tells you how often someone's going out and making those observations and the fact that they're, they did have the skills to do that and they didn't see it, that means it wasn't there. So it's a fantastic tool that we have developed to build on other phenology monitoring programs and you can integrate them back in. So the questions I was answering are, do you see emerging growth? Do you see unfolded leaves? Do you see all the leaves withered, like in that last picture? I showed you, do you see open flowers? Do you see ripe seeds? And each time I go out, I got my little, I was like, oh, yes, I see emerging growth. Here on this first, this first time, there was emerging growth because it was early in the year. Unfolded leaves because they matured and were opening up. All these withered. No, there's still just green growth there. Uh, open flowers. Yeah, I saw open flowers. On this grass, you can see there's the little anthers sticking out there. And ripe seeds. There were ripe seeds on the plant even when I started monitoring already. And so I go out about every week or so on the weekends, get a two-hour break from the kids. It's great. And... So throughout the course of the year, I kept it up, except for when I went on vacation. And emerging growth soon stopped. I saw unfolded leaves. We have a pre-monsoon drought where it gets hot and dry in June. Hot and dry. And this whole dry heat thing, it's just, it's just hot. And everything basically senesces and goes dormant and whatnot. Then it picks up again when, this, when the monsoon rains start in early, uh, about mid-July, early August. Um, and, I, and you know what? If you're managing buffalo grass, and this is I'm going to lead into this little example here, you've got a problem because you've got ripe seeds all year long. So if you're trying to think about, oh, I need to manage buffalo grass, I need to manage the seed rain across the landscape from this invasive plant, you've got a problem because you've got a lot of invasive seeds out, invasive propagules out there. A seed is basically just a plant at rest. It will soon be there. So this is what the landscape looks like up above me. This are, these are these great iconic saguaros, and this is a desert. This doesn't look like a desert. It looks more like a grassland. And you know what? One fire, and it'll be a grassland. This stuff burns hot, burns fast. Buffalo grass, Penicetum ciliare, was introduced from Africa in the mid-30s or 40s for livestock forage and erosion control and spread, and is spreading and is a real problem in this system. And this is a system that doesn't have fire. Those saguaros will not survive a fire through that buffalo grass. And you saw the map a slide or two ago. You saw where Tucson sits right below this. In fact, you've got houses that are nested in this stuff, $10 million homes nested in this stuff. You've got a problem. So the mayor of Tucson is well aware of this. There's an interagency buffalo grass coordination group that's working on this. Arizona had three earmarks last year. You all know what happened to earmarks. One of them was to deal with the buffalo grass issue in a coordinated manner because you stand here in Tucson town and you look up across the little foothill and this is the... Forest Service, oaks and pines up here at the top, buffalo grass. These patches of buffalo grass, and they're growing together. And you have one source of ignition, a little lightning strike during the monsoon season. Someone walking here, boom, phew, up the Catalina Mountains into the oaks and pines up above. And remember how hot and dry it gets. It's a dry heat in June. And so we'll soon see the numbers of brush fires in downtown picking up again because buffalo grass is also invading town. This is what we don't want. If you're the mayor, this is what you don't want. You don't want to see this kind of thing happening. Forest Service bombers are protecting these houses here in the foothills from buffalo grass fires. And this was up in Phoenix a few years ago. Burned through saguaros and the saguaros are gone. A lot of people come to Tucson to see saguaros. Without the saguaros... That's an issue. It's like having no cherry trees. Imagine if there was a virus that hit those cherry trees. Ooh, people would be acting pretty quickly on that virus if they possibly could. So you've got to know something about the phenology to take care of this buffalo grass. So here's what they're doing. Here's another way to paint the vegetation. They're going out with backpack sprayers, and they're spraying herbicide on this buffalo grass to try to get it out of that system. But the only way the herbicide works, anybody here who's bought a Roundup from Walmart, you go spray it on the plant. You don't do it when the plant is dormant. You do it when the plant is active, when those leaves are out early in the morning. Get that herbicide down into the roots to kill your invasive in your yard or in your natural area. And they're desperate. They are desperate. Helicopter. Saguaros. Tucson, herbicide spray. They're experimenting with spraying herbicides from helicopters, broad-spectrum herbicides, Roundup, to kill these grasses 
down in here and hopefully not kill all the native vegetation as well. So wouldn't it be great if you had phenology information and you knew when the buffalo grass was green and when everything else was dormant, which happens, even though it's a warm season grass, it greens up early in the year when all the vegetation, all the native vegetation is just kind of hanging out, waiting. And so you need information about that phenology. So this is one example of the, the way that we're using phenology information. Even I'm contributing with my buffalo grass phenology monitoring, but it's just me. Any one of you, anybody else could be tracking buffalo grass phenology. And we're working with the Forest Service, and there's a crew of, of uh, people who are out there, and are, we're working to develop a phenology monitoring program so we can do this kind of thing. So get involved. This is your project. Your federal dollars are funding the development and the, sustain, the sustenance of Nature's Notebook, and any other organizations that's part of, the, part of the network or wants to be involved in Nature's Notebook can get involved. 3,000 observers across the nation contributing on the order of around 400,000 records so far. You could partner your organization. If anybody here has, your, has an organization, like I'm trying to work with, you know, with uh, college students uh, from underrepresented groups and get them interested in science so that we can get them into, say, USGS or Park Service or Fish and Wildlife Service because we need to build human capacity. Well, here's one way to do that. And the folks up at University of Maine and Maine Sea Grant, Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, Park Service, and Maine Audubon are working together to build a project called, they're calling Signs of the Seasons. And they'll use Nature's Notebook as their platform because they don't have to reinvent the whole data management thing. We'll manage the data for them. We'll work together with them. Park Service is developing a new inventory, has an inventory and monitoring program. Fish and Wildlife Service is developing a brand new inventory and monitoring program for all the refuges. We'll be working with them and working with NOAA. You can get your folks engaged. Who are your people who you're trying to talk to and trying to communicate with? Do they have nature deficit disorder? Probably. Well, the other, another taxi cab driver who I was talking to said, you know, with the advent of, you know, nowadays we're talking about nature deficit disorder a little bit <laughs> with my cabbie, and it was great. He knew exactly what I was talking about. He said, yeah, it's changed for me as a cabbie because people get in the back seat and what do they do? They go like this. He said, I don't have to talk to him anymore. We don't talk to each other even anymore. We don't go outside. We're just busy thumbing. And so get people engaged. And so there's a group of folks who we didn't even know about the Wolf Ridge Environmental Learning Center, but they're like, wow, phenology, we've heard about that. You know, that's pretty exciting. Let's get our constituents involved and engaged in phenology. Let's talk about it. Let's get educators here. Let's use some new tools for communication with the American public. Let's try to go to their ground. They're tweeting, tweeting. I mean, I was tweeting, tweeting. Uh, obviously, you can tell how old I am. YouTube, et cetera. Let's use these new tools to get people in engaged. So we're working on a Nature's Notebook Facebook app. That's taking a little while. We've got to get a few permissions to do that. Leverage on that national curiosity that's out there. We were an agrarian society. We still are. We just don't realize it. So Lewis and Clark, when they went with the core discovery, Jefferson said, go west ye core of discovery and keep track of all manner of things that are flying and whatnot. And when it happens... Because they needed to know when the ice went out in the streams and when the salmon were running and when the flowers came out and when the oaks, the oak leaves were the size of a mouse's ear so they knew when to plant the corn. You've heard that axiom. And people are naturally curious, but it ties back to human evolution, I believe. And you've got a great opportunity in your backyard to do phenology monitoring. I'm working with Giselle, uh, Giselle Mora at Rock Creek, uh, I think she's at Rock Creek Park right here at the Research Learning Center. She's interested in doing a phenology monitoring project. We've got folks all across the nation are saying, this is a good way to engage the public. And I chose the cherry blossoms. That's pretty iconic, of course, because everyone is really tuned into the phenology. They don't call it that. Not one single person out there calls it phenology. I'm here to monitor the phenology of the, of the uh, cherry blossoms around the tidal basin, but that's what they're doing. Imagine if they were recording the information, or if they've been doing that for 30 years, like the folks at the Smithsonian have been doing. And cherry blossoms, as it turns out, the phenology has advanced only about seven days over the last 30 years, based on the Smithsonian records. And Sylvia Orley, who I was visiting yesterday, she says, I'm not sure, you know, is that climate change or is that urban heat island effect or, you know, what? But it's changing. But a lot of plants have changed a lot more than that. Some as few as just a four to four or five days. Others have changed up to 44 days over that 30-year period a whole month and a half earlier. Like grapes in German valleys, sometimes come 30 days earlier. And so you've got to monitor your, you got to manage your migrant populations so you're going to pick those grapes. 
So I'd like to just wrap up there and just say thank you very much for coming and just remind you that Nature's Notebook is just one tool that you can use to monitor phenology. There are other projects out there. Project Budburst, Monarch Watch, Monarch Live, Mo Monarch Live, Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. You know, the list sort of goes on and on, but all these are very good ways to get people involved. Uh, and I, I'm just like, why is he talking about other projects now? It's because we're a network. And to be honest, frankly, I don't really care where the information necessarily comes from as long as it's good information, good data, and we can use it and apply it to understand sort of the pace of nature on a national scale. So check us out at usampn.org. Sign up for Nature's Notebook. Learn how to participate. Get your classes. Get your constituents involved. And thank you very much. Appreciate it. We have time for a few questions. How do we decide what to include, what species to include on our list of potential organisms for monitoring? That was, that was tricky. Um, we started that work in 2005, before the network even got started, because some people had been thinking about building on a historic lilac monitoring project that started in 1954 in Montana by a fellow named Joe Caprio. They brought Joe up to Montana to develop a climatological sort of observation and monitoring program, weather. But there, at the time, when he set that up, back in the 50s, there were like five or six weather stations in Montana. But he walked out of his back door one time, and everybody's got a lilac, and the lilac is blooming. He's wondering maybe there's a linkage between the lilacs and, and what's going on uh, in between temperatures, uh, with temperatures around the state. And sure enough, there were very, very good correlations between what we call growing degree days. It's accumulated heat in the system when the lilacs emerge. And so he was able to build, start building a lilac phenology monitoring program in Montana, spread it to the, uh, to the 13 states. It was later replicated in the, in the eastern half of the U.S. with a cloned lilac. So we fixed the genetic information. So there's actually a cloned lilac network as well. And we've all brought all that stuff together into the current network. So lilacs don't grow everywhere, though. They don't grow very well in the east or the west. They need, to, they need a cold, chilling requirement. And so Mark Schwartz, who was at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, who was sort of the father of the of that lilac network said, I need more species, more native species, because I'm trying to do this geographic perspectives on climate change and climatic variation, environmental variation. So he created another 50 or so species that he thought would be good sensitive indicators. So we took those lists and we brought a bunch of scientists. And you put a bunch of scientists together in a room and you say, out of the 16,000 plants across the United States, or 18,000, can't keep track of the number anymore, which 20 or 50 or 100 should we have? And so there was a lot of talk and a lot of work about species that were relatively easy to identify, widely distributed, economically important, important for other reasons, like they're problematic invasives, would engage particular groups as constituents, etc. So we built a matrix, a decision matrix, and then we looked through and found tax that we felt like would be important. And the question is, do you put in things that you think are sensitive to, to climate change or environmental variation? or not? And do you even have that information? I argue we don't really have that information for 98% of the species out there. We don't know whether they're sensitive or not to environmental variation. And as it turns out, being sensitive is actually a good thing. When your environment changes around you, if you just stay firm and brittle, you got a problem. But if you can kind of flex and adapt to that environment, like the oak and the moth, you're fine. But that pied flycatcher, brittle, not responding to the environmental change. So, so we had to do a lot of thinking, the same thing for animals, and we vetted the list out across the nation. And so now, and we've caught a lot of people, you, know, you develop your list of 200 species. These are the recommended species for the nation. As soon as you do that, someone wants the 201st species that's not on the list. So we've been working on expanding that list out so the Park Service, all 19 Park Service units in, in, in California will be doing phenology monitoring service-wide comprehensive competition, a grant to Park Service, the CESU coordinator there is running this, and she's implementing phenology monitoring at six national parks this spring. Joshua Tree is the very first one. All uh, the other five, and across biogeographic regions, and then all 19 parks next year, if they can get people on board. And this is even independent of the INM network, the Inventory and Monitoring Network. So we're also working with the INM folks, too, because a number of INM, if you're with the Inventory and Monitoring and Park Service, um, and don't know exactly my audience, there are, there are vital signs that they're using for monitoring. 
And so they said, we need California tax. And we're like, okay, yeah, well, we had a national, national list. Let's try to get us some good California tax as well. So we built that up. So each time we add species, we vet the, the protocols back to the, through, the, through, the, uh, through the scientific community, the management community, and we say, are these the protocols that you want to have for these particular species? So that's kind of a long answer to your question. And so now the, the issue is we've got so many. And so it's no longer our issue to decide which ones you should monitor. It's your issue. You're a park. You're trying to decide which of these 700 should you monitor. Well, which ones are important to you? Is Joshua Tree important to you? If you're a Joshua Tree National Park, probably. It's on our list now, in part because it wasn't for a while because it's, you know, we had a national list. We've got it on the list. They're really interested in that because it's predicted that Joshua Tree National Park will become just National Park. They won't be able to call it, they can still call it Joshua Tree National Park. Well, that's a problem with the Catalinas. We don't have buffalo grass out there in Joshua Tree National Park yet, crossing everything. But, um, but seriously, uh, there is a, there is a, uh, the seeds of, of Joshua trees need a, a cold stratification period. There has to be, there has to be cold, there has to be a cold period before they'll germinate. And a lot, there's very, they're right at the threshold in many places. And with warming winter conditions especially, minimums are increasing. It's not the maximums necessarily that are increasing despite what happened in Europe and Chicago, you know, with heat stress and whatnot a few years ago. It's the, it's the, it's the wintertime temperatures and the nighttime temperatures that are increasing. So you don't have the low lows that we used to have. And so they're very concerned about Joshua Tree National Park and the sustainability of the fixed boundaries and the population of Joshua trees within the park. So we need more and better information. I mean, that's a pretty well-known system. We know that system is an iconic species. We know a lot about it, but we need more information like that so that we can better manage these systems in a time of change. Yes? I don't have it on my website. It's in the paper by Camille Parmesan, published in, actually, the, the bar graph itself is not in the paper. I took the data from a table because you can fit that much information into a table in global change biology a lot easier than it takes up a big, a big figure. So I took the data from the table. I left off the standard errors, which indicates the variation around the estimate, and I made a graph like that. It is in global change biology, 2007, Camille Parmesan, like the cheese. You can get that, and if you can't find it, let me know, and I'll get it to you. And I'd be happy to share that figure with you. And what I'd like to do is go ahead and convert this uh, presentation to a PDF, and I'll put it up on the NPN webpage. So if you go to, I think it's resources, presentations, there's a list of recent presentations. And I think parts of this maybe have been recorded, at least the audio, perhaps. And so I think the hope is that there will be an, uh, a podcast that will come out of this as well. And so we'll try to get that link to that podcast up there as well. And all this information is all open source. You know, everything is, is available. We use open source computer code. We use open source software so that everybody can come in and use this. They can replicate the whole system. If they want the phenology protocols, that's actually we, like, we would like to serve them to you using web services if you want. The data are available. They're readily and freely available. Anybody can use these data. So... There's a question here. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So two parts to, to my answer. Uh, one is that we have actually done very little work ourselves with the data. We want to get that into the hands of scientists and the public to do things with that they need to do for their research or their decision making or their policies. So we do a little data summary each year. We're working on the data summary for 2010 right now. There's just a few of us in the office. Sounds like a big project. It is a big project. We've got about five full-time staff in the office. That's it as soon as we get our communications director on board. So four of us and a number of people who are volunteering or part-time. We partner with the Wildlife, the Wildlife Society. We have a TWS employee, the only TWS employee who doesn't sit in Bethesda, sits in Tucson at our office. Uh, so we've worked out with Michael Hutchins. It's been fantastic. So I, I guess I had multiple parts to my answer, didn't I? And then the other question, though, is, a, is kind of more about what are we seeing in terms of the patterns, the spatial patterns that we see. When we first looked at the very first data that came off uh, in fact, if you go to our visual, just check our visualization tools, and I didn't have the space to put it in there, but click on visualizations and go do the map, and you can see what species are people monitoring and where are they. We've got 
sugar, red maple all the way from Louisiana all the way up to, to Maine. And you can, you can run an animation that'll show you, when, show you the data themselves when, you know, whenever there was an observation of a leaf or a flower or whatever. You can layer on prism-generated climatological data in there as well, so you can see how that changes. It's not daily, it's monthly and annual. That's a bit of a pain. It's barely, that's all our servers can do to handle that. But we do want to work with NOAA to get the daily data so you can actually calculate growing degree days or heat accumulation on the fly on a national scale and use that to try to predict patterns of red maple flowering from Louisiana to Maine. That is something that we'd like to be able to make available to anybody to be able to do and to have people go on and explore that. In terms of that lateral variation from south to north, we know that the greatest changes in observed temperatures in the northern hemisphere based on instrumental records are at the northern latitudes because of some positive feedback effects at high latitudes. Changes in snow and ice in particular that magnify the impact of a small amount of warming that we've seen down here. It's greater up there. And uh, there, are, there are signs, yes, indeed, that there, that is having a disproportionate impact as well on communities in ways we never ever would have predicted. You've seen buildings falling off the edge of the sea, falling off the edge of town into the sea. That's because there's no sea ice there to buffer the shore from those big fall storms. Normally there would have been. It would have been locked up by November. Now there's no ice there in November. We're getting killer whales in the lagoons there at uh, Inuvik uh, up, on the, up on the Arctic Ocean. Um, we're seeing uh, the Nunavut Times. Nunavut is the old Northwest Territories and the northeastern part of the nation. The Nunavut Times on the front page. What is that red-breasted bird that you're seeing here so much now when you never saw it there before? It's because, yes, robins, although they were occasional in the northern part of, the North, of North America, they're now actually starting to nest up there. So people are seeing them a lot more. So you're seeing changes in species distributions. Pollen season in Corpus Christi from ragweed hasn't changed very much from June until about October. But as you move further and further north up the Great Plains to the Canadian border, the pollen season is actually nearly a month and a half longer as you, uh, up there than it used to be historically. And the authors of that paper that came out in PNAS, Lou Ziska, folks from the NRDC, a number of other folks, suggested actually might be because of disproportionate warming that occurs there. And it's a fall phenology event the pollen stops being produced when the first freeze comes in the fall. And it, always, it doesn't start flowering and producing pollen until after the days start getting shorter. <laughs> it's amazing what drives organisms. It's a, they call it a short day plant. It doesn't start to produce flowers and pollen until after the 20th of June. When the days start getting shorter, boom, out comes the, le out comes the flowers. And, and so the first frost will nip it. And so there's been no nipping and corpus and, a, and, and much, much less nipping. Uh, there's a delay in the first frost in the fall. And USDA hardness zones have moved up. So if you're a gardener and you're trying to figure out, am I in zone 5 or 6 or 7? Well, you used to be in zone 5, but now you can be in zone 7. There's some places where the zones have actually shifted two layers not from five to six, but from five to seven. How do they make those maps? It's just minimum temperatures. That's all it is, a very, very simple algorithm. So Arbor Day Foundation rebuilt those maps. And it's amazing. You can look at the old USDA hardiness zones. And Arbor Day Foundation came and said, well, what's the algorithm you used? Oh, it's very simple. Let's just recreate that. We'll rebuild the map, put them side by side, do a little change map. Uh, check it out on Arbor Day Foundation website. And so it's going to affect what kinds of things you can plant and when you plant them. And we're concerned about frost, frost incidents. The last frost in a lot of places hasn't changed, the last frost date, because there's nothing to stop those big cold Atlanta and Saskatchewan clippers from coming down across the eastern United States. But it's been warm for weeks, but still you have a big blast of cold Arctic air. So frosts aren't necessarily changing. In the western U.S., it actually is changing. It's, it's a different. There's barriers of mountains and whatnot. But because you have these warmer conditions, you're going to have more and more situations where you have big freezes, like the, the Easter freeze, 2007, across the Bible Belt, reduced the pecan production in Arkansas or Alabama from 7,000 tons to 7,000 pounds for that year because of a big freeze that came through. Phenomenal freeze. 
We have to watch our shifting baseline. How do we keep track of that stuff? Our understanding of what's going on in our backyard it changes each year because, because things change. It's been a long time, 365 days ago. So if you write it down in your notebook, you can actually kind of keep track of that that way. And then we can use that information to really engage you, the public, and create greater trust in trying to understand and how systems change and why they're changing.